Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Kenneth Tharp, I'm Chief Executive of The Place, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our inaugural Kohan Lecture. The Place Kohan Lecture holds up for question the simple provocation, what matters? It seeks to encourage a creative and intelligent debate and uncover a very personal response to this question from some of the most influential and creative minds of our time. The new Kohan Lecture Series is being launched in honour of Robert Kohan, whose 90th birthday we celebrated here in this theatre less than two months ago. We hope that the Kohan Lecture Series will continue annually for at least 10 years. Each year, the Kohan Lecture will be given by a different person, giving a platform to some of the most creative thinkers from all sorts of disciplines and schools of thought, perhaps taking us into territory that may seem a long way from dance. In this, its inaugural year, the Kohan Lecture will be given by the man after whom it's named Robert Kohan. Robert Cohen has the founding artistic director of the place. He's been instrumental in changing the map of dance in the UK, and it's no coincidence that he's frequently revered as the founding father of British contemporary dance. Described by dance writer Clement Crisp as one of Martha Graham's finest dancers, Cohen was also one of her leading partners and indeed associate director of Martha Graham Dance Company. Cohan came to the UK in the mid-60s at the invitation of Robin Howard to establish a culture of modern dance that would be every bit as strong as the classical tradition that was already well established here in Britain. Nearly half a century later, we can look back and see just how much has changed, much of it thanks to the extraordinary support and vision of the place's founder, Robin Howard, but also undoubtedly thanks to the enormous vision, tenacity and artistic leadership of Robert Cohan. Cohan founded the London Contemporary Dance School here at the place, and he led the pioneering and internationally acclaimed company, London Contemporary Dance Theatre, for most of its 27-year history, educating, inspiring, exciting, and growing audiences across the UK and worldwide with a new style of dance. With his company, he won the 1975 Evening Standard Award for the most outstanding achievement in ballet, and in 1978, a similar award from the Society of West End Theatre, now known as the Olivier Awards. He's also been given several honorary doctorates, including one from the Universities of Kent, Exeter, Middlesex, and Winchester. In 1988, Robert Cohen was awarded an honorary CBE in recognition of his outstanding contribution to dance in the United Kingdom. He's since taken British nationality. In 2013, he was awarded the De Valois Award for outstanding achievement in dance at the Critics Circle National Dance Awards. And even more recently, he was made a visiting professor at Middlesex University. In the weeks immediately following his 90th birthday, at the end of March this year, he toured to the US giving five masterclasses and seeing his work performed in universities across California. And he has an equally busy summer schedule ahead. As a teacher, choreographer, and director, his gifts helped to shape several generations of the finest dancers and give birth at the same time to a whole generation of dance makers and dance leaders, many of whom are working today, leading and shaping dance not only in the UK, but all over the world. I was fortunate enough to dance in Bob's company for 13 years. And what was equally clear, working closely with Bob every day, is that he had a huge wealth of knowledge and insight that extended way beyond dance. In Cohan's biography entitled The Last Guru, his biographer Paul Jackson, who's here with us this afternoon, describes how Cohan, growing up in Brooklyn, quickly developed a love for the natural world, being introduced to the, to the lights of fishing by his grandfather Lewis in the many creeks and inlets around the area where he lived. And for years, every morning before school, Cohan could be found on the seafront. He also became a keen ornithologist, and by the time he was 12, he had observed, recorded, and noted over 140 varieties of birds. The breadth and depth of his knowledge and his ability to spark curiosity in others was one of the many things that always made it such a privilege and a great learning experience to be in the dance studio with him. One of the things about great artists and creative thinkers is their unpredictability and their ability to surprise. In the run-up to his 90th birthday, Bob surprised us all, and perhaps himself too, by choreographing two new pieces. It was great to see him back in the studio, very much in his element, creating again, and at the same time, passing on his knowledge and inspiring yet another generation of dancers. And let me tell you, this young choreographer Cohan shows great promise. He's definitely one to watch. <laughs> but now in his ninth decade, Cohan is every bit as curious, as creative, and as questioning as in his youth. And in planning this inaugural Cohan lecture, asking Bob to respond to the simple question, what matters, seemed a good starting point for Bob to reflect on the present, to talk about the things he's most curious about and passionate about, and to be able to share that with a wider audience. So thank you, Bob, for taking on the challenge of the question, what matters, and thank you to everyone in the audience here this afternoon for coming here. 
Uh, before I invite Robert Cohen to the lectern, I also have great pleasure in saying that this lunchtime, you're getting not just one remarkable creative thinker, but two for the price of one. Uh, when I asked Bob who inspired him, he had no hesitation in mentioning a person who he's known for many years, with whom he's worked, and with, in whom he finds great inspiration. And I know that the admiration, respect, and affection is no less great in return from that individual towards Bob. The person I'm talking about is lauded worldwide as a guru on creativity and education. His TED talk from 2006 entitled How Schools Creativity is the most listened to TED talk with more than 33 and a half million views. And he's just published his latest book, Creative Schools. I'm very proud to mention that he's also a place patron. I am, of course, talking about the one and only Sir Ken Robertson. Please give him a very warm welcome. Um, Ken, it's terrific to have, us, have you with us here this afternoon. Uh, not only did the audience get with you and Bob two of the most creative and inspiring minds of the last half century, but with you and I here, they also get two Kens. Uh, I think that's what the Arts Council call value for money. So let me just tell you in the audience um, the, 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 the way things will happen. Following a short opening address from Bob, uh, Ken's role will really to be open up a, a conversation and a dialogue with Bob and perhaps draw out the things that will come out more easy as a dialogue than a monologue. Uh, and at some stage, uh, Ken will open up questions uh, to the audience for questions or comments. Um, a little bit of housekeeping guidance on that front. When you're invited to speak, please do wait for the microphone uh, when you're invited to speak. I know some people like to think, I don't need a microphone, um, but actually we want everybody in the audience to hear what you've got to say or, or to ask. Um, and we're also recording this afternoon's proceedings, so that would really be helpful if you please just hang on for the microphone. Uh, and it would also be great if you could just say your name and where you're from before you comment. Um, any tweeters in the audience, uh, please feel free to tweet. Uh, I think the hashtag is Cohan Lecture. You may want to do that either during the lecture or afterwards, but please feel free. Um, I think we're all set to go. Uh, so please join me in welcoming to the lectern uh, and giving a very big hand to Robert Cohan to bring, begin the inaugural Place Cohan Lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I actually wrote something to start with because I'm very good in conversation, but I'm not so good, just one off. I did this, I was inaugurated at Middlesex as a professor a few months ago, and I wrote down my, le my notes, and I put, I was, because I have a tremor, I don't dare hold them, so I put them on the table and when I got up to speak, I couldn't read them. <laughs> but I, I printed them larger this time, so <laughs> hopefully I can read it. This is just the way to begin. When, what matters, kind of, the, it made me dizzy for the last month, trying to think about how I could answer that question. I came up with so many different answers that it was obvious something was wrong with me or the question. Different parts of myself were actually trying to answer the question one after the other all the time. So taking it as a serious problem, what matters obviously is who you are when you try to answer a question like that. Uh, an example I am familiar with is teaching in a class. I go into a studio uh, expecting to teach. That's the state I am in. And what matters is who you are when you teach. So I try to be that person who can teach. And uh, the students, are they there to learn? I can tell you they're not. Because they're all there for totally different reasons, personal ones. Some maybe, yes, want to learn something, but maybe not what you're teaching. And also, there are people who like to come to class. They don't care what you teach. So, so th this is a, a problem that you have to face. And I'm used to that, and I'm used to trying to get their attention and making that attention enter their bodies in such a way that what I'm teaching to them matters. 
The same is true of me myself. When I put the question to myself, I was like the teacher and the students all at the same time. I kept shifting so much that I couldn't find a consistent answer. So again, what matters is where you are, how you are, who you are at the moment you try to answer that question. The first thought I had when Kenneth uh, put the question to me was that it depends whether I'm shopping in Tesco or Waitrose. <laughs> <laughs> Because in Tesco's, you have to worry about the quality. And in Waitrose, obviously, the price. <laughs> so maybe, maybe we're all asking that question to ourselves all day. Maybe it's the necessary way to live. What matters? I know as you get older, what matters changes radically. That's what makes grumpy old men. Simple things like answering emails right away or saving for the future. Anyway, I know that I'm expected to and I expect myself to find a more profound answer than shopping at Tesco's. <laughs> so I started with dance and what matters in all the ways I know to learn and to teach and to perform. And some of that information, I, I know the answers. I think I do, at least some of them. I can, in a dance class, teach what matters. I've been thinking, and not for the first time since I actually was in combat once, why we think war is a good way to solve problems. As a people, we are still so tribal in so many primitive ways, and yet personally, everyone thinks they're civilized. So that, certainly that matters. How about culture, education? Could knowledge instead of information help change the world for the better? As an artist, uh, this question is very important to me because I'm still working. I'm still intending to choreograph. And even though I try to work for myself, from inside myself, I can't help but be affected by the culture I'm in. I've always been curious about everything around me and uh, the, the kind of sensation of the culture. And that's what I work from. I'm worrying the question all the time, actually, and I have been, truthfully. So I'm hoping that I'm going to have a eureka moment when I will wake up and know what matters. At the moment, what matters is that I cannot answer the question. So I think I will join my very intelligent friend. <laughs> I first met Ken in the last century in Hong Kong, I think. We, we were arguing about it. I think I met him first in Warwick University when we used to perform there, but it doesn't matter. He moved to California where he is seriously attacking the American defense line of industrial education. So maybe he can help me find what matters. <laughs> So just to be clear, your answer to the question, what matters is you have no idea. Well, no, I have too many ideas, therefore no idea. <laughs> when you said, um, by the way, I just want to, be, before we get into this, um, a word about me. <laughs> no, the... <laughs> when Kenneth, that Kenneth, uh, asked me to do this, I was just thrilled, truthfully, because I am a huge admirer of this man. He really is the father of contemporary dance in this country. I used to live around the corner from here in the 70s, uh, in Burton Street, uh, before I was distinguished. <laughs> I lived in a squat around the corner, <laughs> for free, challenging the force of capitalism, for free, around the... <laughs> 
And I used to pop in here whenever I could and sneak in the back and watch shows when he was artistic director. And I had several conversations with him and Robin Howard, and I got very involved with the Gulbenkian Foundation later on, and Peter Brinson. And through him, met Bob uh, in 1982, I think, in Hong yes. Kong, and we've known yes. each other all that time since. And as Kenneth said, I was asked to be a patron. So to me, this is a homecoming. I grew up professionally in this area under the influence of people like Bob. So it's a real privilege. And I, people Thank who aren't you. familiar with Bob's work, and not all of you in the dance world, um, can I recommend this book? My Paul, where is Paul, by the way? Uh, Paul Jackson. This is Paul Jackson here. This is the book, it's called The Last Guru. It's a wonderful account of Bob's life and work and achievements, and I think it's for sale outside, Ken. So if, if, uh, if you're still not sure what matters <laughs> at 1.30, just buy the book. You know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> That's what matters. <laughs> Bob, um, you, you said just there, uh, you mentioned combat, and people mm. might be surprised to hear you mention that uh, in a, uh, a conversation that they may expect to be wholly about dance. But that was one of the big formative experiences for you, wasn't it? As, as a young man, you were, yes. you were called up to war. What, yes. why, why, do you, why did you include that in the, the few minutes remarks you had? Is that, why was this Well, so because that was obviously a very strong changing point in my life. Uh, it's interesting that uh, people who have been in combat don't talk about it. And uh, that's common knowledge that you know, my father was in the First World War. He never talked about it. That's what people say. And that was true of my father. And uh, he, he, my father said, oh, I was gassed. I don't remember anything. So that's about the way it goes. I was, when I turned 18, it was the middle of the war, war D, whatever, two, three. Second World War. Three, second, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, not, not the War of Independence. No. <laughs> no. Oh, I still fight that. <laughs> <laughs> You're still fighting that one, yeah. <laughs> yes. Get, get over it, Bob. <laughs> it's supposed to be here, <laughs> yes. So you're uh, 18, Second World War. You, Second you were World War. Oh, no, you volunteered, uh, I think, didn't you? No, no, no. There was no choice. <laughs> Uh, you knew when you turned 18, you got the notice in the mail and you had to show up a week later or five days later. And I did that and I was put into a unit that was out in California and we had the eight weeks preparation to become <laughs> combat troops. Uh, I was very lucky because before that, I had taken a test. Uh, I have to go back. Uh, we heard that uh, the Army had a specialized training program, and only people who were very intelligent should take this test because if they passed it, they would do something. So I went to my teacher and said I wanted to take the test. I was then 17. And she said, oh, Robert, you're not intelligent enough. So I, I got furious, and I, I insisted that I take the test, and I did very well on it. And I was put into a unit called ASTP, Army Specialized Training Program. Just to be clear, this wasn't a test of your combat skills. This, <laughs> this was an IQ test. Definitely an IQ test. Right. But I was very prepared for that because I lived a life up to that point that had nothing to do with normal education. I educated myself, as, as Candace said, with the natural world, with biology, which I was fascinated in, with dreaming, with dancing. Uh, I was taken to a dance school when I was four years old, and I was living in my imagination. Your mother took you to the dance school, didn't she? Yes, she did. And, uh, I don't remember what we did, but we danced. <laughs> you, you, you did something called Adagio. Oh, that was later, yes. Um, after something happened in the dance school, my mother went to the bathroom and she came down and took me out of the school instantly. I don't know what she saw there, but she wouldn't let me stay. So, <laughs> For those of you who don't know, I'm sure you probably all do know, 
we live in America now, and nobody in America uses the word toilet for some reason. It's called bathroom. It's the bathroom. <laughs> Why? Nobody well, gets a bath in there. <laughs> it's called the restroom. Nobody rests in there. <laughs> it's a toilet. But she went to the toilet, and she came out, and she immediately removed you from the school. <laughs> For reasons she would never disclose to you. She never told me. Even, even the last years, I never got it out of her. <laughs> but Something happened in the toilet. <laughs> anyway, to move on. <laughs> I, I think this matters. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly mattered to her. <laughs> Uh, I, well, anyway, that, of course, my imagination was crazy. Why did I, why did I get taken out of that class, <laughs> which I was enjoying? But then I went to the local tap, gymnastic, and adagio. And adagio was the Brooklyn name for ballet, because nobody understood ballet, but everyone knew what adagio meant. So I did that as well. And my first time on stage was dancing tap to Swanee River in blackface. Candace said, Candace said, I wouldn't get away with it now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I didn't know what the word encore meant, so people were yelling encore. And I was bowing, and I went off, and I, absolutely wide-eyed, and somebody put the whole record on, and I went out and did it all again. <laughs> so that was my first theatrical experience. But then, uh, I think it was this, this idea of living your own world within the world that you were born and brought up in. And in my own world, I became intelligent for the idea of an IQ test. If A goes there, what does B do when C does this? And I could do that. That was And, and just problem. to say, this was Brooklyn in the 40, 30s and 40s. Yes. So it's not Brooklyn as we know it now. Oh, it's very different. Yes, it was it, like being in the country. Uh, the South Brooklyn, where I was, uh, was right on the seashore, and there were creeks, inlets. I used to play in something called the Old Mill, which was a huge wooden mill that worked a water wheel that when the tide came in, the wheel worked and went out. And there, there I fished, I crabbed. Uh, the Italian population there was mixed Italian, Irish, and Jewish, all mixed together. And we had no immigrant problem. We were all immigrants. And uh, the Italians grew wonderful Italian vegetables, which we all ate. We used to go in there God, I can't remember, I can't think about it. We used to go in there when the, in the summer and have tomato fights, <laughs> throwing ripe tomatoes at each other, but they must have loved us. I and, thought there was no immigrant problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was the tomatoes, it wasn't. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I, so I passed this IQ test. I got put into the army with a lot of men who were very intelligent. And not only that, highly cultured in a way that I wasn't. I didn't know about classical music. I didn't know about, really know about ballet. I didn't know about, really know about drama. I, I read a lot, but I read sort of Tom Sawyer, I don't know, books like that. And this was one part of the army changing my life. I suddenly discovered the whole world of art. And uh, the other thing that changed my life... So what, what, what did that mean, that you discovered the whole world of art? I mean, well, how they, they would, when, when you were, sta we were stationed in California, we would all get on a bus on the weekends and go down to Los Angeles or up north to San Francisco. And they were buying tickets for the ballet or a concert. And, Nobody else did that. The, the, I didn't know that you should do that, so I went along with it. And when I first saw a ballet there, it was the first time I saw people doing what I thought I could do. I, I, I saw a wonderful ballet. I saw Anthony Tudor dancing. I saw Nora Kay dancing, Andrea Glevsky, Rosella Hightower. 
uh, all dancing at once on the stage. I think I even saw Ma um, Markova and Anton Dolan one night, all in California, all this naive Brooklyn boy who was, yes, that's what they should do. That's what they could do. And I instantly knew it. But, but you'd grown up loving Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. That's and right. Tat. That's so right. Was, you but loved the, that anyways, but was this a, a different type of experience oh yes, entirely? This was totally different. How, how was it this different? This was called serious. <laughs> serious. This is... Uh, but did you feel it was different as you experienced it? Yes. This was culture. In the kind of world I was brought up in, the society I was brought up, if classical music came on the radio, you turned it off. I mean, it's this question which I think is existing now. It's about being entitled. You don't feel that you're entitled to that. That's in another world. That's another part of society. And the society I was brought up in, that wasn't acceptable because you couldn't talk about it with anyone. Mm. Society meaning the local culture of the families yes. and the street. You couldn't go down on the street and say, I listen to Chopin, and nobody would know what you're talking about. Who's he? You know, so it was that. It was a radical change to me. And I went back to the camp library and Nobody was listening to records then because they were all, or mostly all, classical in the library. And I listened to everything. I had to educate myself musically in order to stick up, to stay with the kind of thinking that these guys were doing. And I mean all of them. They were all from a different culture than I was. But some people, Bob, would go to an, a, a ballet performance, never having been to one before and just not get it and shut off and think, when is this over? Yes, I know. So what, what was it about it that, that pulled you in so strongly? I can't think of anything other than I could do that. This means something to me. It's significant. It, I belong there, that kind of thing. I know what they're doing, not the steps, but I know where they are as people. I know why they're there. I yeah. felt an instant empathy. When I came here to, I was stationed in Warminster, I saw a miracle in the Gorbals with uh, Robert Helpman. Uh, it was then the Sadler's Wells Ballet be before it became the Royal. And I was even more moved because he could turn what I had learned was ballet into modern dance, which it was at that time. Mm -hmm. And he could actually tell a story in modern dance that made you feel emotion. And this actually moved me even more. Yeah. And once you're moved that way, you follow, you follow that movement in yourself. You want to find it again and again, because that's unusual. Yeah. The only time most people are moved is when they get angry or, or they fall in love or they get depressed. They don't even know what that means, most people. They just feel bad. Uh, but we're, we're very seldom moved inside. Uh, we think we are, but we're not really moved. Till we fall in love. When you fall in love, you get really moved. And that's what I'm talking about. Or if you go to the theater mm. and you, or you hear music or you hear somebody singing and suddenly it affects you. Yeah. Something happens inside. Tears come to your eyes. You, you feel inside yourself, you're, you're touched. That's, that's for me addictive. Yeah. So this wasn't an IQ experience at the back. <laughs> this was a... A vis uh, visceral a, connection. A cultural IQ, yes. Yeah. But, but no, a visceral sensation. Yeah. I, want, I want to come back to that, but just, just go, go back to this combat experience for a moment before we leave it. You, you, so you're in this unit. Okay, so they, we thought we were doing something for the atom bomb, I think. But we didn't know that at the time. But then, then the American army thought they were winning the war. They just had to put more people in. So they dissolved that unit. They took all of us intelligent 
so-called intelligent IQ people and put them in the infantry, which meant that they all got killed. L which literally? Is, literally. Okay. I was one of the few, I was wounded, but I lived. You were um, wounded badly, weren't you? Yes. I, you can't be wounded well, you know, but, <laughs> but, but it was a serious wound. Yes. Um, yes, I saw an artillery shell land in front of me, a huge explosion, and I got thrown backwards in the air and landed on my back, and I had a hole in the center of my chest. Called wounded. <laughs> uh, but the person you were with was killed, killed outright. Killed outright, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> uh, that's why we don't talk about it, because it's another world, the war. It's uh, combat. It's just another world. It's utterly gruesome in the worst way. And, and you don't even know why you're really there. Uh, here, here you are facing Germans the same age as you, 20, 21. And you're supposed to kill them because if you don't kill them, they'll kill you. And uh, somebody has decided that's what you have to do. And you do do it because you don't want to be killed. And you don't want to kill them, but you have no choice. You have no choice. You put it into a locked situation that is gruesome, that shouldn't exist. But still does and continues. Well, it's because we're still primitive, I think. As a society, we still... I just got into an interesting conversation about carrying on the sins of the father. I said, well, that has no relation to me. I am not carrying on the sins of my father. I reject that completely. I'm finding my own life, and I'm going to live the way the future should be according to me. And that has nothing to do with the sins of my father. I have to watch everything I do that I believe it's right in honest and clear. And that's the way to go forward. Mm -hmm. So I reject all of that I re as I reject the war and therefore a lot of the way we govern ourselves. You were talking earlier about, um, it seems an oblique connection, but it's a real one, I think. You were talking earlier about uh, you, you, the movements that animals make, uh, which are identical to many dance movements. Uh, yes. <laughs> and it sort of shows how thin the the veil is between us and the rest of life on Earth. We often think we're so separate from it. But. Absolutely, absolutely. I was, I was trying to work on the theory that dance is hardwired in us. And if dance is hardwired in us, why do we have to go to class and learn how to do it? And, and if dance is hardwired in it, why doesn't the audience actually understand it instantly? and so forth. Well, in actual fact, they do. Partly because it's been sort of made on television a little more acceptable. So dance now is quite acceptable as a, a form of art. I don't know that it's acceptable as a form of meaningful art, but that's something else. But I was thinking about, in thinking about dance being hardwired, I thought, well, let's see if I can find animals dancing. And of course I did, on YouTube. I found a gorilla who cleans, cleans the floor and then puts his shoulder down and spins around on his shoulder, just like that. And then stands up, looks, and goes out of the cage. And then comes back and does it again. And spins around on his shoulder. So I thought I would have a video of a break dancer and then the gorilla. And, and I found another gor gor a gorilla or ape, I'm not sure, who his floor was wet, so he dances on the water like little kids do. And then he, and pirouettes, <laughs> two, three, four turns, stops. And did you like that? Yeah, <laughs> and he, does it, he does it again. And I found cows being let out for the first time in the green pasture in the spring, and all they did was jump for joy. They just jumped and jumped and jumped and jumped. Some of them stopped and ate right away, but, <laughs> but there were other ones just kept jumping. So I, I think the, 
we know about birds doing mating dances. Uh, David Attenborough showed us all of that. But we are not that far away from it. And if you watch some of these uh, ape societies, they do all the facial expressions that we do. They do the body language. They turn away. They face you. They do it. They do it in their way, but we're doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. I, as a choreographer, I watch people all the time. Uh, my favorite thing is actually here, Regent Street or any Main Street, to go and stand against the wall and watch the society passing me. Because I, I try to make a study of body language. Uh, I, I try to, I can even make up stories. That, that guy is rushing to get lunch, I know that. And he's gonna go back to a boring job because he's so relieved to get out of it. This girl just had some terrible news. I wonder why she, I do that as, as a pastime. So I do it with the animals as well. I know it's called anthropomorphizing, but they seem to understand each other. Mm -hmm. And I understand them. Mm -hmm. And I have lots of experience with dogs. And I know my dog, Ace, knew himself in the mirror. It was not another dog. He knew. And one day, which is in the book actually, but it still is vivid in my memory, he was he used to sit in the studio upstairs and the dancers would all leap across the floor at the end and then they would applaud and he would immediately get up, go to the corner and leap and watch himself in the mirror. And he would watch him do it and he'd go back and forth and I would applaud him and, he would, and then he would sit and look in the mirror and one day I said, come on, Ace, I was behind him. I said, we have to go. And he looked at me in the mirror. He didn't turn around. I said, let's go. And he started to get up. He watched in the mirror. So that means he knew I was in the mirror and he was in the mirror. Mm -hmm. I like that because I think we are animals, basically. And we've got to use our brains in order to control that animal in us. Mm. Does that, that make sense? I'm, it absolutely does. I mean, it, it, if you look at the, the evolution of the brain, uh, most of our brain is in common with other animals, I mean, mammals. And, most of what we attribute to being human is uh, the, the consequence of a, quite a small skimming of the cerebral cortex. Um, the, I, I'm trying to remember the name of the book now, maybe before we're done I will, but um, there was a quotation at the beginning of one of the uh, editions of the Encyclopedia Britannica from this book. It was about our relationship to apes and apes intelligence. And um, I mean, I live in America where some people don't believe in evolution. Uh, I, I do believe in it, but um, <laughs> um, but you know, people become very baffled only, by only in America. <laughs> yeah. But people become very baffled by you know how can human beings do such appalling things to each other just before we're done with, with the, the, the combat issue. Um, uh, but the fact is that most of our evolutionary history has been um, as as apes, and not as not as humans as we think of ourselves just now. And, uh, you know, and we've created religious myths to account for our, uh, our morality or to give us a framework for it. But anyway, the point of this particular um, quote was to say, uh, I think I've got it right, he says that, hum that human beings are not fallen angels, we are risen apes. <laughs> That's good. And, and he said um, that you know, we, how shall we be remembered in the stars? By our massacres and wars or by our symphonies and poems. And I think that is right. There's a, an essential truth in that, that a great deal of what impels us is, uh, is pre-human. And, and we've only been around as, as, as modern human beings, as a species, uh, for about 150,000 years. I was looking at this recently, the, the, the planet is about four and a half billion years old. Uh, I mean, we were cooking for a long time, but but we've only been in our form, like groovy people, like you and me, who can hang out, um, for about 150,000 years. And I was doing, doing some sums on this recently. It's, it, it's hard to get your head around that, I think, but in my head anyway. But, 
But if you think of the whole history of the Earth as one year, the whole four and a half billion years as one year, human beings showed up at less than a minute to midnight on the 31st of December. Oh and for God. most of that time, uh, we were in some pre-human state, I mean, for millions of years. I mean, the dinosaurs lasted 30 million years. We've been around for 150,000, and we're already endangering our own survival. Partly because we haven't fully invested in our own humanity yet, which I think is what you're talking about. That's absolutely what I'm talking about. I'm, ta I'm talking about externalizing your life instead of internalizing it. Uh, I'm talking in dance. I mean, let's go back to dance. In dance, it doesn't matter what you do. It matters how you do it. Now, that immediately changes from the outside to the inside. Uh, so it doesn't matter what technique or dance or form or whatever. It doesn't matter what you do. It's you, the person, doing it. That is the most important thing. And it's you, the person inside yourself, not only the person, but one of the people that you have inside yourself, but the one that can empathize and make the body move in such a way that it makes other people understand you. And that is totally internal, and that's what we don't do. We don't do it. All, all day long, we move, in a sense, automatically. Yes. We, we're, we're like ping pong balls. It doesn't move unless it's hit. It bounces off something, it bounces off that. And if you look back at your life every day, how many bounces did you do? How many times you did totally irrational bounces or, or mechanical ones, ones that you do every day? And why should you do that? You have the advantage of being conscious. You have the advantage of trying to work out what is going on inside yourself. I know it, it, sounds, it sounds a little self-preoccupied, but that's where we should be. Mm -hmm. uh, we should be inside ourselves learning how to live. Mm -hmm. Instead, we just sort of bungle through life. Just, Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I think it's absolutely the, the right point. I mean, one of the... Um, I, I think it's a, a distinction made by many people. Um, there was a book published probably about 35, uh, 1972 uh, by a guy called Robert Witkin. It's called The Intelligence of Feeling. It's a very good book, though totally incomprehensible. <laughs> um, I took some comfort from that because I, there was a brilliant philosopher I knew called Louis Arno Reed who didn't understand a word of it, so I was thrilled <laughs> by that. I, I found it very encouraging. So, because I didn't either. But I knew it was important. And, but but one of the points that he made at the beginning, and it's been made by many people, and it's in every faith tradition it's the same point, really, which is that we, we all live in two worlds. Now, there's a world that existed before we came into it. It'll be there when we're gone. It's a world that exists independently of us, okay. the world of other people and things and objects mm. and materiality okay. that's there anyway, um, that exists whether or not you exist. But there's another world that exists only because you exist, the world that came into being when you did, you know, the world of your private consciousness, the world that is you, that will end or change according to your beliefs when you do. And one of my concerns about education is the education system is filled with the outside world, and it should, I mean, we need to know about the world around us, of course we do, we live in it. But we need to understand our in, inner world as well, you know, what, what lies within us and the landscape of our own feelings and, and our drives and intuitions. And that's the bit that's most neglected, I think, in the way we educate our kids, and, but also in the way we live our lives. That's, is, that's well, what you're saying, uh, isn't it? It's not it's not done at all in education. Yeah. Once you get out of kindergarten where you learn to play with paint and all that, it's just not done anymore. No. You're, you're, you're learning facts, figures, or how to get on with somebody else, but you don't even know who you are to be able to get on. Therefore, you, you have relationships with people that are phony all the time because you're never telling the whole truth and they're never telling the whole truth. And we make a whole structure this is why dance was so important to me. Uh, Gray, Gray, Martha Graham always said, the body never lies. And she's absolutely right. The body doesn't lie. You can, you can fake something and think you're getting away with it, but you get on the stage and the body doesn't lie. If the, if I know I can sit in the audience and read it. I know I read it because I, th I then go back and say something and I know I'm right. The body does not lie. Well, how then can you dare to get on the stage and show yourself? 
You have to work on yourself. You have to work internally on cleaning up the mess that you, you kind of gather all day long in the normal life. Can we, can we just talk a moment about Martha Graham? And, um, because you, you went to the ballet when you were uh, in training and then that stopped, you were injured, you were, that was the end of your war at that point. And, yes. Um, you went back to New York and I remember reading that you had some friends who kept telling you you should go to see Martha Graham, you should go to yes. her classes. Yes. And, uh, and then you did. Absolutely. There was one, one girl, one woman in particular, Dion Meredith. I've never, I lost track, I lost contact with her, but she came from, uh, she was in, the, in film and she came, a dancer in film in Hollywood, and she came to study with Graham. And I was with her and showing her around New York. And she kept saying, you gotta come, you gotta come. And uh, I never even heard of Martha Graham. I heard of Balanchine, but not Martha Graham. And uh, I went, I took one class, and I've said this many times, just sitting on the floor, breathing like a, every Graham class starts. Can, can you say that? But this wasn't Martha Graham teaching the class, was it? No, no. It, it was, so it was, the temp gone, the it was Marjorie Mazia, who was the okay. wife of uh, Woody Guthrie. And uh, she was a wonderful, beautiful woman, beautiful dancer. She was in the Martha Graham Company. And I just had that streak of lightning that comes, illumination, whatever. I knew that that was what I was gonna do for the rest of my life. It was what, that simple. What was that, Bob? I mean, did, was it something she did, something she no, said? No, no, it was something had... I was doing. It was the movement that I, I was doing. I just, you know, later on I thought, what, the Kundalini rose in me? Something happened <laughs> special that lit up the fires? I don't know what it was, but I, I, I get goose flesh thinking about it now because it was so intense. Yeah. And, I you, did. and I, you said you were trembling with the, the power yes, of this. Yes, I, I, I had this huge power in me. And I knew that this was where I belonged. This is what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And that was wonderful. It was so freeing. Mm. It was so simple. Mm. And I, I had a smile for weeks because I found, as you would say, my element. You know, I've, I found, but really I had the experience of it. Yeah. And that was and, extraordinary. And then you met Martha Graham. That was another experience, yes. There was this lady sitting on a bench, and I knew instantly that had to be her. She didn't pay attention to anybody. It was, she was in a very small space, a very small studio, one just curtain changing rooms, and a little bench in the, in the area where the desk was, and there she was. Wonderful, amazing, a woman, who was totally inside herself, sitting there on the bench. And everybody went by trying not to look. We went back and forth. And then I had her in a class to teach, teaching. And then it was even more extraordinary. She was uh, in person, in class, not on the stage, not, not, um, not the kind of photograph images or what people say about her. Just her presence was magical. That's why people call her a genius. She was special. Uh, you knew when she was there, I, I, I always have trouble trying to describe it. She was connected in a way to other things that you were not. When I say other things, when she moved, it was like there can't be any other way to move except what she did. That was it. It was perfect. When she showed you something, of course she was right. That's the way you felt. It was like a spell that she was able to create instantly all the time. And partly it was because she was so physically connected to herself and so intense inside herself about what she was doing. She was never somewhere else. 
She was doing it inside herself. She wasn't even really looking at you. She was being what she wanted. And it was a wonderful lesson on how to be yourself. Yeah. And, and you worked with her for how long? Well, after uh, 10 years intensely, that means intensely means every day, all day, for 10 years. Sunday was the best day to work because nobody else was working. Yes. Uh, holidays were wonderful because the studio was empty and we could work. And uh, over the course of those 10 years that you've worked so closely with her, did she ever become sort of less, of a mystery, less of a mystery to you? Did, did you fathom her more as she went on? Or well, it was interesting that she, she could just stand there and, and sort of gossip and laugh. and Not serious gossip, just about it, about her world, which was all dance. And we could talk very simply to her. You could be friendly with her. And, and then suddenly she was this extraordinary figure in front of you. You were never, I was in her house and I was friendly enough to be invited to her house, talk to her. Uh, she had no social graces in that sense. You didn't sit around and drink and chat. <laughs> you, you, you had to, she could also lose her temper, of course, because if things didn't go the way she wanted, as good as, as perfect as she was when she was good, she was just as perfect when she was bad. And she was, I, I still know I saw lightning shooting across the studio when she was attacking someone. It was violent. Everybody would go flat against the wall and try to get insignificant. <laughs> Not, not me, Martha. Not, yeah, I didn't do anything. Yeah. So she, she was... But that, you accepted that because something was wrong. Hmm. And she made it visible that something was wrong. Whether it was her or you or whatever, something was wrong. And, uh, and we... So she helped, she made, or helped you become the dancer that you she, were? You know, I think, I think it's, a, it's a very simple process. As, a, as the artistic director for a long time of a company, I know that frequently, or a lot of the time, the dancers in the company work for you. They want you to see that they can dance what you're asking them to do. So I worked for Martha. I wanted her to enjoy what I was doing, to appreciate it, to help me get better, but you dance for that person that you're following. Yeah. And in that sense, she educated me. The other thing was that she was a wonderful teacher because she held nothing back. She demonstrated everything in such a way that you could see the muscles move. And she would tell you which muscles to use. So it was not a secret. She would show you where the energy came from and how she did what she did. It, it would fill her body, and you would try to imitate that. And gradually, you would begin to find those sources within yourself. Mm. And, and that, that was a great lesson, not only to find yourself, but to find how to teach. I mean, you, you spent your life, sort of, I suppose, almost equally as a, as a dancer, as a choreographer, and as a teacher. Um, there came a point when you said, was it in the early 70s when you decided that you didn't need to dance anymore? What, yes. what happened? Uh, this was, I had been dancing, I was 42 years old. I had been dancing regularly right up to there. And I could still jump. I was dancing very well. And we were doing a performance of a dance of mine called Eclipse in... Uh, I know where it was, it was in the south of France, Chateau Vallon, an outdoor theater. And I was dancing with Noemi Lapsaton. And in the middle of this dance, which I knew, I had choreographed back in the uh, 60s, I think, I knew it very well, but I just had another flip flash. I don't have to dance anymore, this is it. And I thought, what, what's going on? I've got to go over there and get her. <laughs> and 
I suddenly realized that I just didn't have to be on the stage anymore, that my performing life was over. And I came off stage very excited, and I said to everyone, I had a wonderful experience. I don't have to dance anymore. And everybody said, oh, that's horrible, Bud. That's terrible. You should go on dancing. You dance it so well. I said, no, you don't understand. It was wonderful. When you said you didn't have to dance anymore, do you yes. mean you didn't feel the compulsion the, it, to dance sort, anymore? Sort of. I didn't know I had the compulsion, in actual fact, but I must have. I wasn't aware. I loved being on the stage. But dancing wasn't an option for you previously. It was something you had to do. I had to learn to dance first. Then I had to perform well. And then I had to be on stage with Martha Graham. It was a process. In the beginning, when I was on stage with her, she wouldn't look at me. She would never look in my eyes. And one day she did. And boy, was that scary. <laughs> on stage, and she's actually looking in my eyes. I better look in hers, I better, <laughs> I better be what she's seeing. And that was good, because that was a big step up. And then I just accepted that I would be on the stage. And like all dancers in performance, uh, something you don't talk about very much. I was just talking about it with Ross McKim, who was teaches at uh, directs Ron Bear School and is just leaving. And we were talking about this experience. I mean, I know it's said all the time that you, you suddenly are aware that you're in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. And all three things come together and you're in the perfect world. Now that frequently happens to dancers on the stage. It's a very personal experience, and sometimes it can be more extreme than that, in that I, know, I, don't, I don't like to talk about it, actually, but uh, there was one time, there were several times, but there was one time that I was, Martha was there and I was here, and I turned into an abstract series of balls of fire and extensions of electricity and things like that. I had a, an experience of something that was not myself, not my ego, it was something else. I felt like I was full of electricity and I was in another world. I was in another consciousness. Uh, now, that happens often. So. Often, I don't know, but it happens. It happens at various layers. Mm. Uh, sometimes it's just that you feel good there. I know dancers say, it's the only time I feel free is on the stage performing. And I think that's what I meant when I said, I don't have to do it on the stage anymore. In other words, I could do that in the rehearsal. I yes. could do that off the stage. Yes. I didn't need the extreme. Being on any stage, even this one now, is be like being on a tightrope for, for an artist. Being on the stage is always dangerous. Mm -hmm. It is dangerous. It's just like being on a tightrope. Anything could go wrong at any moment. Yeah. And, and it's only your skill and awareness that keeps it all together. You know, for, for a lot of people, when they finish dancing, that's, that's, that's it with dance. But then you had a whole new incarnation as yes. one of the world's leading choreographers. I, I want to come to that. So, but we have about 15 minutes left, and I want to get some oh questions in from the audience as well. So if, if you have a question, can you be forming it? And, uh, <laughs> and we'll, we'll get a, a microphone to you. Uh, given, just given how little time we've got, can I ask you to ask a question rather than make a speech? <laughs> <laughs> Only so we can get you know, as many in as, as we possibly can, but I'll come to you in just a minute. Just get yourself ready for it. But, but what, what sort of choreographer were you then? I mean, I mean, were you... What did you take from being a dancer into being a choreographer? The, the first choreography I did was a solo uh, with a dagger, of course. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, it was called Perchance to Dream. <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> perchance to dream. And it was about that. And, I mean, you have to get rid of that in the beginning. 
So that's what I did. <clears throat> and uh, you choreographed yourself. I I was teaching with Martha at yeah. the summer course, and I was demonstrating for her the first week, and she was going to leave me to teach the rest. And they wanted all the teachers to uh, to choreograph something. Yeah. So I said, "Can you help me? Chore can you choreograph something for me?" No, you do it, darling. Uh, can you help me? Yes, I will help you. Uh, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I had this idea. I need a chair. She said, oh, take the chair and the Oliver Smith designed for me. I don't use it anymore. So she gave me the chair. And she said, we set a time, and she didn't show up. <clears throat> so I choreographed a little. And then I called her, and she said, oh, I'm sorry, something happened. But yeah, go on, keep working. I'll come tomorrow. Well, the next day she didn't come. And by the end of the week, I realized that's what she was doing. And then she came, saw it, gave me a few little notes, and that's how I learned to choreograph. <laughs> Trying to make something that she would like. <laughs> and you did? I did. <laughs> so but when you were working with other dancers... Then, and then, I had to, then I had ideas, because... To be a choreographer, you have to think a different way. You have to think of a whole kind of... Uh, you have to think of it all in one go, I think. You have to think of the movement, the stage, where it's going to be, what's going to happen, how you're going to do it, all in one go. And suddenly, I got that feeling that I could do that. And, and then I started choreographing. And that came more intense as I went on. I don't mean planning it all out and writing it down. I'm talking about magnetizing yourself. Magnetizing yourself. Magnetizing so that you can. I always think of a, choreo a good choreographer should be able to go in front of the room, studio, and be so magnetic that everybody does the dance. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way it should be. OK. Yeah. so. I can't quite do that, so I have to work it out, but I have to be that magnetized. And do you plan the dance before you work with the dancers? Is it all in your head and you just I get them to no, do it, I, so to speak? I plan the quality, but not the an quality. According, quality according to the music or how, what I think I can dance, I can choreograph to, and how it can work. And then I worry about it intensely for months or weeks or months, whatever time I have, and then I do it right there. So if you take something like Stab Up Marta, which is one of your, as it were, classic pieces, it's a yes. fantastic piece, how did that, can you well, that, how that that's came a together? That's com a complicated story because uh, I had a music director who came to me with Vivaldi's Gloria, and he said, here, Bob, why don't you use some real music for a change? <laughs> so. I listened to it, it was too big, I couldn't do it. So I gave it back to him, he came with Stop and Modern. And I thought, he's right, I should do this. So I listened to it maybe 500 times over a period of three, four months. It's an overwhelming piece of music, isn't it? Yeah. And, and it's uncountable. <laughs> uncountable. Uncountable. <laughs> you cannot, <laughs> it, it's full of 13s, 5s, and an unbelievable score. Anyway. I, I decided that I would actually choreograph it, so I made a date for the opening performance. I still hadn't done a thing. <laughs> and I kept playing it, and finally it got desperate. We were two weeks away, and I went to the south of France where I had a house at that time, and I listened to it all weekend, and suddenly, one evening, when the sun was setting, I knew I could do it, just like that. I knew I could do it. And I called Moff, Janet Eager. I said, please get all the girls together, nine girls, for Monday. I flew back and I choreographed it in a week. It just came together. Just like that. And, it, and does the dance, in your experience, does it change much according to the particular dancers you're working very with? Very much so. Uh, I was very fortunate. I taught my dancers. I worked with them. I knew them, 
and they Because they came through the school. They you came through the, the school. They, they came, came through, through the school. They came into the company. I knew them, and I knew what they were capable of, and I knew how much I could stretch them. I knew how much I could uh, push them on to be better, even, and they would immediately work into the fabric of my choreography yeah. as people that I knew. So, so, so were you a similar choreographer to Martha? I didn't have her genius, but I, I, I tried to do that. I don't mean were you, were you even in the same style, but... Was well, your... I think you, you, it's, it's hard to know. I was more eclectic than she was. I did pieces like Eclipse, which is very... But, but what I mean is your method of working with dancers... Was, was, that was it... the same. Sorry. The same. That was yeah. the same. Yeah. She worked with what material was there, and uh, the material was you. Yes. So she worked with the, all, the you, all the me's that were there and formed them into this concept, this idea yeah. that she had. And that's what I did as well. And that's, in that sense, I didn't, never thought of myself as a choreographer. I thought of myself as a teacher. Yeah. What, what were your principles for teaching? There were, there were three. Yes, it was to teach only what you know. Don't make something up that you think you can teach. Teach only what you know. And even if you can know very little, it's, an, it's usually enough. Teach everything you know. Don't hold a little bit back because it makes you superior. And I've seen teachers do that. And then the other thing is teach with love. Now, everyone, I mean, I mean love, that you have to have that sense of love in you. You have to love the fact that you're teaching these people and helping them along their way. Or you have to love your art form so much that that shows to the students. So it's that kind of love. And uh, those three things, I think, will take you a long way. And if you can't do it with love, do something else. Absolutely. <laughs> I know, I know lots, of, uh, lots of us teach for money uh, at some point in our lives because we have no choice. But even if you're teaching for money, don't do it unless you can teach with love and somebody pays you. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's bring people in. There's somebody at the front here. Can we get a microphone here? Uh, Richard Lee from Jerwood Space. Um, uh, Bob, you've spoken really eloquently and, and quite movingly about those, those moments of revelation in your life where you suddenly knew something, you could suddenly see something. And I think that's, that's given us goosebumps listening to you. Are there any, uh, I suppose you'd call them rosebud moments, moments that you treasure that maybe you don't always talk about from your own creativity, from the moments when you've, you've made something in the studio, when something was revealed between you and your company, when you saw a movement or a, a, a sequence that suddenly made you gasp. Yes, yes, very much so. Uh, there are always moments when again, you're in the right place, doing the right thing at the right time, in the rehearsal, where you come to a point where you're not quite sure how to go on, and you have to take a moment. And I was very lucky in that I could close my eyes, and I could visualize, I, I could play the music, and I could visualize the dance happening up to that point where we stopped, and I could just let it run on, and it would go on. And I'd say, oh, I know what you do next, and we would do the next thing. And sometimes that happened, and I would say something quite strange to the dancers. We'll do this, do this, do that, do that. You come in, you attack here, like for 20 minutes, uh, 20 seconds, I would go on saying that, that uh, you know, to, to choreograph a piece, 20 seconds or 30 seconds is a lot, because you only do a couple of minutes a day. And then when you play the music, they would do it, and it would work perfectly. And everybody would go, wow. And that's that's wonderful moment, yes. 
and you, you know. As a matter of fact, as a choreographer working that way, I tried to count on that happening. I tried to count on the fact that my intuition and the magic of the room and the people and the whole of the energy would actually create something. I hoped that, not only hoped, I counted on it. And this, that did, we had, we always had wonderful moments in every dance where suddenly everything worked and it came together. And then I'd have to say, remember it. Remember what you did. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> remember that. <laughs> Don't forget that bit. <laughs> Tell, a question over here, thank you. What are you working on at the moment, Bob? Uh, I'm doing a duet in August for Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Goddard and Laurel, I can't remember Laurel's last name, but I'm sorry, but for the Yolanda York Dance Project. I'm doing a, a duet to a piece of music that I love. Uh, it's being done by the Kronos Quartet called Lacrimosa. What, what is it that, that, that draws you to a, a piece like this? Is it, is it the music? Or the it's very simple. You hear a piece of music and you know you can choreograph to it. <laughs> and you hear another piece of music and you think, I have no idea what to do with that. I mean, you could work on it like I did on the uh, Bivaldi. Yes. But why not use, I mean, I'm 90 years old. I want music that I know I can choreograph <laughs> <laughs> right away. <laughs> Yeah, you'll get round to it. <laughs> what about... Uh, but but some people, sometimes people choreograph not to music at all, but to noises, to sounds, yes, to scratches. Yes, yes, yes. Well, you, you know, you may... Is the music important to you? Half the time. A good half the time. Uh, the music... Uh, I like dancing to the music, but I like to dance to the music, choreograph to the music in my way on the music. Yes. In other words, using the two things together, not to it, not Mickey Mouse. In. Although that's good sometimes too. But most of the time you make up the movement in silence. So that's strange. And then you put it, you listen to the music, you make the movement up in silence, and then you put it to the music. Mm. Other times you can play the music and you start improvising to it. And yes, you find something. Yeah. But you don't find a sequence usually. Mm. You find a way of moving. Mm. Which is why we could talk about making a dance. Yeah. Well, unfortunately now, there's a lot of dance being made. And I say unfortunately because a lot of it is making dances. Uh, it's very easy to make a dance. I usually say when I'm teaching a choreographic course, don't be so special about the fact that you're a choreographer. Even your mother could make one good dance. <laughs> Even your mother. Even your mother can make one good dance. <laughs> but two, I don't think she can do. <laughs> but the, the thing is, there's making dances and choreographing. And I think they're two separate things. That's good. How many questions have we got, just so we, we know? We've got OK, eight. sorry. That's OK. We'll go ahead, and then we'll come. Thank you. Again, we're running very short of time, so. Quick question. Bob, is there a way that you prepare in talking about these moments, they're wonderful, I, I understand. Is there a way that you prepare to choreograph? Will you prepare in any way to yes. make these happen? I put my charger on. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that because I, I, I did a little bit when I say I count on it happening, but I also charge myself. I worry about it. When I'm choreographing, I don't do anything else. I don't do anything else. I eat, sleep, and, and think about the choreography. And I think that's part of it. You have to charge yourself. I don't go out and watch other dances. I don't do anything like that. I really work intensely on myself so that uh, I know I have to be in the studio from 2 to 4 on Tuesday and then from 1 to 3 on Thursday. And I have to be creative those times. So I aim for that and I hold myself together until I get there, and then I'm charged. Yeah. Uh, hi, Bob. Um, my name's Honoré Guique, UK-based choreographer. Once had the wonderful privilege of you mentoring me as a student here at the place way back in the 90s. Not quite sure how to ask this question exactly, but it's to do with um, 
I suppose, training. Recently, there was a lot of um, hoo-ha uh, about uh, a few high-profile, I think, UK-based dance makers yes. criticizing the training <laughs> uh, here and the quality and standard of dancers. So I'm trying to form a question with this. Um, my opinion was they asked it, but didn't uh, actually offer any solutions. So uh, the two parts of the question are, um, uh, one, do you think there should be more um, intimate relations between artists who may raise these kinds of questions and institutions, and therefore the manner in which institutions train? And secondly, uh, what do you think about the standard of UK dancers currently in comparison to the rest of our global village? Do you really have to ask that question? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can uh, close the session there if you want. <laughs> it's, it's a very complicated question and can't be simplified that way. It can't be simplified with a single answer. Uh, I, obviously, I taught from a very strong technical point of view in the physical body because I believe that the physical body as it is it's, it's fine as it is to watch television, work at a computer, and do lots of things that we do, run about, eat, dance, all that. But when I see somebody on the stage, I expect to see something extraordinary. Now that extraordinary doesn't have to be on point with her leg up here. It has to be something that touches me, that I, that I see that's special. And one of those, th I don't want to see an ordinary, I'm, years and years and years ago, back in New York, we had a performance one day, we all went to a gymnasium, and we sat in, like this on a big seat, and people walked across the stage for half an hour. And the choreographer had gone out in the street and ask people if they would do it. And they would walk up the stairs to the loft or to the gymnasium and then walk across the floor. They got a drink and they left. So yes, it was an interesting idea. And, and, but I do that on, as I said, on Regent Street or Oxford Street. I don't have to sit in a gym and watch it. So uh, it, it's reinventing the urinal that Man Ray put in a uh, Paris exhibition said this is a sculpture. And I think there has to be, okay, that's fine, but I think there has to be more tuning. There has to be more, sens sensation is not the right word, more tuning to the body to shape it to what you want to do than sometimes happens. But it does happen. There are very good dancers coming out in some times and some places. So I think it's very complicated. It depends on uh, it, de it depends on the cultural need around you as well, and uh, that's changing. And it's gotten more radical. It's gotten bigger. I think if the body is, if the bones of the body are in the right place, and I'm serious about this, if our skeleton is perfectly placed, that the muscles will form as you do any dance in the right way. And what I think is that a lot, a lot of times, we, we can't assume when we go to a dance class that our skeleton is in the right place. Most of the times it is not. It is affected by our whole childhood, the way we, we work, the things that, that happen to us. And if the skeleton, it's, if the bones are not there in the right place, it's not worth watching it. And uh, I, for me, that's the most important thing. Now, that sounds like a really weird answer, but I know I'm right. If the bones are in the right place, the body will develop perfectly. But most of the people that study dance, the bones are not in the right place. And most teachers, a lot of teachers, I should say, don't know how to fix the bones. You know, um, you always have to say this, but it's actually true right now. So we could talk all day, <laughs> and, and we have to be out of here. Um, do you have any final things you want to 
Say to us, Bob, that. Well, I hope we talked about what matters. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.